On September 12, 2023, the following press release was issued. Human Brain Project celebrates successful conclusion. Begun a decade before, on October 1, 2013, the Human Brain Project was an effort to simulate a human brain using supercomputers. The HBP would run for 10 years as a flagship of the European Commission's newly formed Future and Emerging Technologies, FET, initiative. Spread among 155 cooperating institutions from 19 countries, the project was led by the brilliant Henry Markram, a South African-born Israeli neuroscientist and professor at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Luzen in Switzerland, and director of the Blue Brain Project, a 2005 endeavor that sought to create a digital reconstruction and simulation of a mouse brain. To build this simulated brain, the European Union awarded Markram a $1.3 billion grant spread over 10 years. In 2009, Markram had given a TED Talk that ended with the following. There's a lot more to do to test these theories and to test any other theories, but I'm, I hope that you're at least partly convinced that it is not impossible to build the brain, and we can do it within 10 years. He suggested that the simulated brain might even attain consciousness. And if we do succeed, we will send to Ted in 10 years a hologram to talk to you. Thank you. But behind the celebration of its successful conclusion and its list of achievements and accolades, the project had fallen well short of its original goals. Simulating the brain, it turned out, was a significantly more difficult task than had first been imagined. Within a year of its launch, concerns arose about the diversion of resources from other science budgets. These culminated in a letter signed by more than 800 neuroscientists expressing concerns about the HBP's governance and scientific scope. Under pressure, the HBP underwent a significant restructuring. The scope was narrowed from building a complete brain simulation to focusing on more achievable goals, such as developing brain-inspired computing technologies. The brain, the whole brain, was and is simply too complex. I'm Josh Young, and this is Playing Odd, a podcast about complexity and information in the natural world. Episode 1, A Structure Too Complex. The adjective we commonly use to describe a truly large number is astronomical, and for good reason. There are a lot of stars. On a clear night and with good vision, we can see about 5,000 stars, only a tiny fraction of our galaxy's 100 billion. 100 billion is undeniably a large number, but as humans, we have exceeded even this. In 2022, Micron Technology launched a 232-layer VNAND chip containing 5.3 trillion transistors, each connected to the larger integrated circuit by three wires of only three nanometers width, for a total of almost 16 trillion connections. Words about this scale begin to lose meaning to those of us unused to dealing with numbers in this realm. And yet, this unimaginably large number is only about a tenth of the number of synapses or connections in a human brain. The brain is enormous, a genuine galaxy unto itself. And the synapses of the brain are far more complicated than computer circuits. The transistors that are the elemental unit of a computer's integrated circuit can exhibit one of only two states, on or off, or in the language of computer science, one or zero. The values are discrete, uniform, and repeatable. They are digital. The neuron and its multiple synapses are nothing like this. The connections between brain nerve cells, or neurons, are what we mean by synapses, and they are roughly analogous to transistors in our example. 
Each neuron can have as many as 7,000 of these synapses connecting each of these cells to 7,000 neighbors. But in stark contrast to the uniform and discrete connections of the integrated circuit, different synapses can exhibit different degrees of influence on the state of the neuron. The system is intrinsically analog, and on top of this, it is not even static. That is to say that the influence that a particular synapse has on a particular neuron can itself change over time. We call this influence the synaptic weight. Synaptic weights, the connections, are strengthened and weakened as a result of reinforcement, and this is the mechanistic basis of learning in the brain. Synaptic strength and neurotransmitter dynamics add an additional layer of subtlety, of computation, to the dynamics of the brain. It goes without saying that these circuits and these synaptic weights are not random, that they serve precise functions and demand a complex architecture. But from where does this architecture come? Where is the blueprint? Six years before Henry Markram's TED Talk, another science mega project reached its culmination. The Human Genome Project received $3 billion in funding from the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Defense with the objective of sequencing, that is to say mapping, the entire human genome, the collection of genetic material of our combined 46 chromosomes. In the event, the project sought to map a human haplotype, or half of our paired 23 chromosomes, for a representation of the entire genome within 15 years. At its conclusion in 2003, 92% of the genome had been mapped, although the remaining 8% would take an additional 18 years of work. Described to the public as the book of life, our genome is composed of coding regions, or genes, and much larger stretches of non-coding regions, what used to be called junk DNA. Prior to the launch of the Human Genome Project, the consensus among scientists was that the human genome contained about 100,000 genes. This book of life, the construction manual for an entire human, is remarkably small. Data are contained in nucleotide base pairs, or simply base pairs, analogous to bytes in a computer program. The combined genetic material of all 46 chromosomes amounts to over 3 billion base pairs, or 770 megabytes of data. That's 770 megabytes, not terabytes or even gigabytes. 770 megs would hardly make a dent in the smallest USB drive. Of these 770 megs, only about 2% is coding. Only about 2% are actual genes. This hardly seems enough to build a brain, let alone an entire human being. At its conclusion, the Human Genome Project found that the estimate of the total number of genes in the human genome was wrong. There were not, in fact, 100,000 genes to build a human. There were far fewer, only about 20 to 25,000. This remarkable finding of the Human Genome Project, of the paucity of human genes, makes our question about blueprints even more salient. How can 20,000 genes encode for 100 trillion synapses? Here we come to one of the major themes of this podcast series, the idea of information compression. We will see compression come up in our discussions of simulation and, indeed, of understanding itself. Those of us who use computers, which is to say all of us, employ data compression every time we zip a file. The utility of doing so is obvious in that compression allows us to send larger files and photos that would otherwise exceed email constraints. For purposes of illustration, I downloaded the UK's National Archives Modern English Translation of the Magna Carta, a proto-constitution in which King John ceded some rights to those of common birth. The text runs to just over 4,500 words. Saving this text as individual letters in TXT format, the file comprises 25,000 bytes of information. 
compressing these 25,000 bytes of characters, spaces, and punctuation as a zip file reduces its size to 10,000 bytes, a reduction of 60%. This sort of compression is called lossless because the original information can be reconstituted with perfect fidelity. We can achieve much greater degrees of compression by applying lossy strategies. When we save photos as JPEGs and music as MP3, the algorithms actually remove some of the original data to compact the file, not 60%, but by 90% or more. However, the reconstituted JPEG picture or MP3 song does not exactly match the original. Depending upon the chosen degree of compression, often termed quality in computer lingo, the difference may not be discernible to the listener, but the reconstituted file is not completely faithful to the original. Genes do not lend themselves to lossy compression because the substitution of even a single nucleotide can result in a dysfunctional product. Indeed, sickle cell disease is attributable to such a single base pair substitution. The discussion of single nucleotide polymorphisms is involved and beyond the scope of this podcast, but the fact remains that genetic impression is relegated to the lossless. Genetic material in some form is thought to have been extant for more than 3.5 billion years, the estimated age of the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA. That is a lot of time for natural selection to foster genetic impression strategies and indeed our genome exhibits many. These can broadly be subdivided into regulatory elements and alternative splicing. Regulatory elements are parts of the genome that encode not for protein synthesis, but rather act as controls to turn genes on and off. They are like the conditional statements in a computer program, the if-then-else statements. I imagine many of the audience will be familiar with computer programming, but I wish to include those who are not, so I will give a non-programming example. In the stock market, itself a complex system to which we will return, it is common to place conditional trades. These take the form of if stock X hits price Y, then sell Z shares, or buy as the case may be. For example, a conditional order can be given to a broker to buy 1,000 shares of Google if the share price dips below $120 and buy 5,000 shares if the price dips below $100. This straightforward order is mostly composed of conditional statements. The only action command, analogous to gene activation, is buy 1,000 shares and buy 5,000 shares. The remaining nearly 70% of the order is composed of control statements, of regulatory elements. Such is true of the genome, only to a much greater extent. While only 2% of the genome codes for the action of producing proteins, the remaining 98% are not devoid of information. Perhaps a better way to envision the genome is as being composed of two sorts of information, information about product and information about process. The gene contains information directly related to its protein product. The regulatory regions contain information about the process of evoking and suppressing production. We will see that this product process dichotomy is a defining feature of complex systems. As humans, we are unused to this way of thinking. The blueprint of my office describes doors and walls, but not when to build them. The design of the cabinetry is just that, a design of a thing. It is not an instruction to build a shelf only when fewer than three shelves lie beneath it. To truly understand complex systems, we need to see the interplay between process and product, and much more besides. In this episode, we've come from marveling at the immensity of the brain and seeing our hubris at trying to encapsulate it in computer hardware, to our surprise at the tininess of our genetic blueprint, to strategies of expanding the effect of this genetic information through regulation and conditional activation. But do these genetic controls provide enough information to build a brain? In our exploration, 
we'll see incredible genetic and epigenetic tools, talk about non-genetic information, and ask what we mean by information in the first place. In the meantime, consider your own brain, vaster than a galaxy and built out of so little. I want to thank you, kind listener, for taking this journey through complexity with me. A bibliography for this episode, along with links to additional material, can be found at playingodd.com. I hope that this program will serve as an opening to a broader conversation. Please write to me with your questions or comments at josh at playingodd.com. I look forward to spending more time with you next week. I'm Josh Young.